In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to all our participants today in the, for the third Sunday of Advent, which is Gaudete Sunday. We're halfway through the Advent season, uh, halfway through our preparations uh, for the Nativity of our Lord. So um, I know my brother and I are, are both praying for you that your journey is going well and your spiritual preparations um, are uh, in place and advancing as they should be. Our, our text this coming Sunday come from a prophet, which is probably little known to most of us, uh, Zephaniah, uh, the prophet Zephaniah. So we have a chance to look at Zephaniah chapter 3. I encourage you to write this down, uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14 through 18. Um, we're also going to be looking at Isaiah, the responsorial psalm coming to us from Isaiah 12, verse 2 through 4. Um, the gospel text from Luke chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. Luke 3, 10 through 13. Through, through, sorry, through 18. Um, and finally, the epistle from Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. So let's start out here in the Old Testament reading from Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14 through 18, and encourage you once again, get out your Bibles and uh, make sure we're actually doing a Bible study here together. You know, I was just speaking with, uh, with uh, my mother-in-law, and she said, well, you know, nobody else is doing this gospel reflection thing. I said, well, you know, actually, it's not true. There's a lot of people out there that are doing a, maybe a little gospel thing before each Sunday, a lot of good people doing good work and good commentaries, but there's a tendency in our modern society and our to, uh, to go from what used to be called education that would take place over an hour or two hours or, well, a lifetime, to smaller and smaller sound bites until we're now doing so-called gospel reflections in five seconds or less. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's not what we're into here at the Institute. We want to dive deeply into the text. So what we're doing, I hope, is something that is unique, but that requires a bit of work, some digging. So we're going to look at Zephaniah. If you can't find it in your Bible... Uh, don't go to your index because that's just, you know, makes it, uh, that much more difficult for you to ever learn where the books of the, the Bible are. So Zephaniah, again, a little known, uh, one of the, one of the prophets that I encourage you to read over the next few and days. The trick for people to find it is if they open up to their prophets section, which is right around the middle of their Bible and find their prophets. And then to find Zechariah first. Zechariah is 14 chapters long. And then once you find Zechariah, you just rewind a little bit past Haggai, and there's little Zephaniah, which is only a few chapters. There you go. And Zephaniah, I think, Father, correct me if I'm wrong, is one of the pre-exilic prophets just before the Babylonian exile, right? And he preaches to the north, to the to the to, to the, the northern ten tribes that had broken off from from the throne city in Jerusalem. Am I, am I right about that? Well, he's based at that same time. Yeah. He's, he's prophesying to uh, the, all the people who are left and primarily Judah at this point, but he's, if you think of him as a little Isaiah, so Micah and Zephaniah and Isaiah are all the same time, pretty much the same audience. Uh, Hezekiah, you'll see right at the beginning of the book, there a reference to Hezekiah. So right. Okay. So this is after the fall of the North. I had said he had gone to the north to. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this would be after the fall of the north. The um, the Assyrians have conquered the northern region, and the primary focus is now the south. Right. Which, uh, why your namesake is there at the beginning? Yeah, they, you so, know, you point out something that's really important, and so let's just read that before we jump into this text. Whenever you're reading one of the prophets, and this I do this all the time, guys. You have to you know not to keep all this stuff in your head. At least I can't. But look, right at the beginning of the prophet tells you where you're at in salvation history. So look at chapter 1, verse 1. The, Lord, the, the word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, the son of, of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, the son of Amar, uh, Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. 
So there you go. There's my my little correction to me. I said he went to the north, but no, it's in the days the, in the days of uh, of Josiah. So which, what are you going to do? Well, you can go back to Second Kings, um, where you get the kind of historical context and read about those days during the time of of uh, of Josiah. Okay, what's going on during that time? Okay, so. Uh, let's jump right into the text here, Father. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. Shout for joy, O daughter of Sion. Sing joyfully, O Israel. Be glad and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed the judgment against you. He has turned away your enemies, the king of Israel. The Lord is in your midst. You have no further misfortune to fear. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Sion, be not discouraged. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty Savior. He will rejoice over you with gladness and renew you in his love. He will sing joyfully because of you, as one sings at festivals. Now, Father Sebastian, just as we're jumping into this text here, um, you know, obviously, this word rejoice, which... Trans, uh, the translator didn't quite give us so so nicely here, but this theme of rejoice over and over again, Gaudete, uh, is because of Gaudete Sunday. But there's but that's placed in a in a broader context, and that is of, of Advent itself. So for us to understand the place of this prophet uh, in uh, the preparation of God's people for the coming of the Messiah, if you could kind of contextualize a little bit what Zephaniah is talking about. Again, reminding us, reminding us in that context of when he's living and so forth. Sure. The, um, so Zephaniah, he's the uh, a prophet in that pre-exilic period, just like you said. And, uh, and he's prophesying about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. But he's also, as like Isaiah does, the other prophets, they, also, they don't leave on a, on a bad note. So they talk about a restoration, a coming restoration as well. And so that restoration uh, is described in chapter 3, verse, oh, about 8 and following, or especially verse 11 and following. So I encourage the, the audience, when they're doing some Bible study here, to go back and read the whole of chapter 3, because it gives you a nice sample of how the prophets spoke. The first half of chapter 3, the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The people are going to be destroyed. The, 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 the nation will be destroyed. And then halfway through the chapter, there will be a remnant. And from that remnant, God will rebuild the people of God. He'll rebuild the city. He'll rebuild, rebuild, restoration, restoration. And so that's what we're looking at here. And if, if our audience were to look at verse 11 and following, they'll see a lot more of this theme that we're looking at. And that is this theme of daughter Zion that we start out with in verse 14 at the beginning of our reading today. Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Now the translations vary in the English, but I thought it would be helpful uh, to look at this in light of the, the Greek here. The word sing aloud or rejoice, O daughter Zion, at the beginning of verse 14. This is the same word that we hear in Luke 128 when the angel says, rejoice or hail or whatever translation you have in your Bible, rejoice, chere, rejoice, O daughter Zion. That's what Luke's hoping we're going to hear. We, someone might say, well, I'm hearing the Hail Mary. Okay, that's very nice. But the Hail Mary is a beautiful prayer, which is built off of that text. Yeah. And Luke's hoping you're going to think back to this text right here that gives us that very same word, and as you look at the greater context of the second half of chapter 3, you're going to hear also a lot of allusions or a lot of things that will end up in the Magnificat in Luke's Gospel too. So Luke's trying to really emphasize from the moment Mary comes on the scene in Luke chapter 1 to the close of chapter 1 there with the Magnificat all that, is Mary is the new daughter Zion that was prophesied. She's the remnant, the faithful remnant personified from which the... Which mm -hmm is going to come you know there's a <clears throat> there's a excuse me there's a phrase here that keeps repeating on that day on that day on that day when when I, I always highlight that or undermine it in my Bible because it reminds me that the prophet is speaking about exactly that on that day the restoration of the kingdom 
when the Messiah comes. And those are the lines that the people are, 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 are kind of stuck in their head. This is what it's going to look like when God finally acts, when, when the full restoration of uh, God's people takes place after the Babylonian exile, here's what it's going to look like on that day, on that day, on that day. And you can kind of pick that up there um, in, uh, in, I was just kind of, as you were talking, listening to what you were saying and, and seeing those words on that day, itch, this is what's going to happen. And then that last line of the gospel, the very last line, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. So certainly God's people at the time of Christ are, are, have Zephaniah kind of in their mind as the other prophets that kind of use this line over and on that day, look, this is what it's going to look like. And, um, and this, the theme of daughter sign is so important. If I'm not mistaken, Father, this goes back even to this remnant that's left there. You kind of alluded to this there. This remnant is left there during the Babylonian exile. Um, the kind of a faithful remnant when all of God's people are taken off to Babylon. There's a small group that then becomes kind of iconic of, uh, of what's going to happen when the full restoration takes place. Am I reading that properly? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's in, that's in Jeremiah chapter 40. So if the audience wants to do a little more Bible study, a lot of times we think of the Babylon exiles when the Babylonians came in and took the Jews off in exile. Well, that's Part of the story, but that's not really all that happened. The, there's a bigger drama going on. The Babylonians come in, the most wicked, the most wicked who are worshiping the false gods, the, the, uh, the pagan gods, they are killed in battle. And those who were just slightly less wicked went into time out in Babylon for 70 years. But there was a faithful remnant so God's people were divided into three groups. There's a faithful remnant who remained in Jerusalem and in Judea, who were left there by the Babylonians. And as we read, Jer we can read about this in Ezekiel 8 and 9, why this happens. And then the very description of it actually happening is Jeremiah 40. And basically, it's they're, they, are, they had remained faithful to Yahweh. These are the monotheists, the few monotheists that had remained faithful to Yahweh, and they were persecuted by their own people. They were persecuted by the king, by the, even by the priests in the temple, who had all turned to polytheism. And, and these people, though, remained faithful and were therefore left behind, were left in the land that God had given them to till and keep it, until eventually those who were in time out would join them and, and, and join the remnant and become one remnant again. You know, you mentioned that they were kind of like to till the, till the land. And I always love that image of these, this faithful remnant who you ask, when you say they're faithful, the, you're saying, what are they doing, right? They're, they're, they're doing something which is, which is restorative of the image and likeness of God in, in who's, you know, it, uh, of the image and likeness in, of God in which they were made. Of course, Adam and Eve were meant to till and keep the garden in the beginning. So there's a connection. I always love seeing that. These are the vine dressers, or the gardeners, if you will, that remain. And then they connect that with Christ coming out of the tomb and Mary Magdalene seeing him as a gardener, as man fully restored in the image and likeness of God, who was, is the gardener of gardeners. He's the one that planted paradise in the beginning. And so in that, that's a, maybe that bigger context. But here we are on Gaudete Sunday, and we hear about this faithful remnant that even though we're in this time of preparation uh, for the nativity, uh, we realize that today the Lord has made himself present among us. That while there is expectation and preparation, yet the expectation is only for those who really understand what the Lord has done for us. Um, and it, the responsorial psalm coming from Isaiah chapter 12 kind of kind of cements this theme for us. Cry out with joy and gladness. Rejoice, right? Rejoice. For among you is the great and holy one of Israel. So do we have almost like, it seems to me, this interesting thing taking place in the context of God's people in Babylon and even in the context of the remnant left in Jerusalem, that while all of this turmoil has taken place in their life, there is a realization that Really, the Lord is present. The, he's there. We're only awaiting the full restoration of the, of the kingdom. But that, the, the most important part of that restoration 
has taken place. God indeed is my Savior. I am confident and I'm not afraid. My strength and my courage is in the Lord. He has been my Savior. With joy you will draw the water at the fountain of salvation. Cry out, rejoice people, even though you find yourselves in exile in Babylon. Even though you find yourselves still in Jerusalem, but really Jerusalem has been decimated and burned. And how applicable that is that to us today in the church, in the crisis that we're living through, that there still is a realization that well, all around us, it seems like those who, have, who are the shepherds of the church, those who are, have become her enemies, nevertheless, we realize, and in these moments of crisis, we realize where our true strength is. It's not in man. Um, and it's, it's, it's only that we're going to find our strength in the Lord, who is the one who is our Savior, no matter what's going on around us, the realization that that is true. And then, and then we can expect that the Lord will act. And when he acts, that act will be something so beautiful in two ways. First of all, the destruction of all things evil and the restoration of what is truly good. This is what is just, we dive right into, like a, just head, just diving right into it here in Luke chapter three with John the Baptist. Okay, these, these two things, there's gonna be a burning up and a purification and there's gonna be a restoration to what, we are supposed to be like. Um, now, Father, we're jumping in here in Luke chapter 3, very much like we jumped into Zephaniah on a helicopter, right into the middle of the text, and there's just no context given, okay? Um, I think most people listening to this text from, from the Gospel of Luke would immediately attach on to, yeah, that's a good thing. That's a nice thing. If we're supposed to give two cloaks, if I got one, I got to give two, you know, I got, I got two, I give one away. I shouldn't be overtaxing people if I'm a tax collector. I mean, these are all kind of nice things. But really, you know, John is being prophetic in the most prophetic of the senses. He's, he's coming with cleansing words. Um, and uh, I was just looking back here at John chapter three in the verses prior. And, and to ask myself the question, see, the, we begin the text right here. The, the crowds asked John the Baptist, what should we do? Well, why are they asking him the question? Why are they asking the question? Well, I went back just a few verses, and look what John says. You brood of vipers, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come? So John's down the, on the Jordan River, and all of a sudden he turns around and lays into the people standing around him. So, Father, I was just going to, you know, we didn't really prepare our, any thoughts on this, but I think it would be helpful for you to kind of paint the picture. What's going on down there at the Jordan River? Who's coming? Gee, we've been there before. Out, it's out in the middle of the desert. Who's making this journey to come to him? And why is John so, I mean, he's just full of vinegar for these guys. You, you brood of vipers, how dare you come down here? You know, who's he talking to and why is he being so, say, strong? And what's going on? What's the, paint the picture for us. Well, the, uh, the most important theme would be the prophet Malachi. Malachi is uh, one of the last prophets of the Old Testament. He's in the post-exilic period. So on the other side of the exile from Zephaniah that we were looking at, and Malachi's prophesying right around, probably put him around maybe 490 or something like that. <clears throat> the people have returned from exile. They've rebuilt uh, Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the temple. And, uh, and now there's a problem. The prophets have all said that they would someday return. Jeremiah had prophesied they'd return after 70 years. And Ezekiel talked about when they returned, they'd rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And in fact, in Zephaniah and Isaiah, you look and this restoration is all very, very dramatic. And they're always, the prophets always speak of the climax of the restoration is not just returning, but the, that God would return, the glory cloud would return, the Messiah would return. But here they are now, they've returned from exile, they've rebuilt Jerusalem by themselves, they rebuilt the temple, the Messiah wasn't there. And the temple's empty. The glory cloud's not there. When the whole purpose of the temple is to house the glory cloud. There's no glory cloud. It's like building a, a garage, not having a car. <laughs> park in 
So, so it, it's, it's a constant reminder of a problem. So God sent them the prophet Malachi to encourage them because the people began to wonder whether or not God had completely forsaken them, whether or not he was going to return, whether or not all the prophets would be fulfilled. And so Malachi comes and says to them, God has not forsaken you. God loves you. And the reason why he has not yet returned and all of the things have not yet happened as you thought is because you're not yet prepared. You're not yet ready for his return. And, and then he describes in chapter one of Malachi, and I encourage our audience to, to read that. He describes the problem. The people are offering sacrifices to God, but they're offering lame animals and sick animals, which is the type of an animal you cull from the herd anyway. If you've got a hundred sheep and you see one limping, you just, you take it out, you feed it to the to the animals or you eat it or whatever, but you don't leave it there because it could be a danger to the flock, especially if it's sick. So you cull the herd constantly. So what they're doing is they're taking the callings from the herds and giving them to the priest to offer to God. Well, this is that the, they're treating God as if he's a pagan God, as if he need, if he's hungry. Well, sacrifice doesn't change God. Sacrifice changes us. And it only changes us if it's a real sacrifice, if it actually takes something that we're trusting in that we think is going to give us hope and fulfillment and joy and to give it away so that we can then have our hands open and ready to grab onto the hand of God, which is the only place we'll find true joy and fulfillment. And so the prophet Malachi said that God would send before he comes to prepare them to turn from themselves, this inward this egocentrism, to thinking of just themselves, to thinking of others and preparing for God's return by turning toward their neighbor and giving to their neighbor what their neighbor needs. Take, if you have two coats, take one and give it away. And this is the problem in Malachi chapter one. They're all trying to control and protect themselves and guard what they've got and just throw sacrifices to God as if he's a pagan God to feed him things that they don't need anyway. What God says, no, no, no. You need to take the things you're hanging on to that you're trying to protect and keep that you think is your security and you need to let go of it. Mm -hmm. As I've given that to you for those around you who are in need. And now once your hands are empty, now you're ready to grab my hand. You know, so that, that's how John the Baptist is. He's coming as that, that Elijah who has come to prepare the people as Malachi says, for the coming of the Lord. What you're saying is, I think, super helpful to understand how the people respond to this. We're going to look at the text here in a second. There's, a, there's an old Arabic um, saying that I learned from a, from a lady in my parish. She, says, she said it to me in English, of course, but she said, she said um, why, um, why do you keep your hand closed? Open it to others so that the Lord can put into your hand what he wants to give you. And uh, isn't that a beautiful way? So with that image and with the prophet Malachi, what you said is really important, Father, because it, we, we want to get into the mindset of the people as they're hearing John speak and then understand why they react the way they react. So let's look at the text here. Luke chapter 3, verse 10 through 18. Luke chapter 3, verse 10 through 18. The crowds asked John the Baptist, okay, uh, what should we do then? <laughs> What do you want us to do to begin this, this restoration? And he said to them in reply, whoever has two cloaks should share with the person who has none. And whoever has food should do likewise. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized and they said to him, teacher, what should we do? And he answered them, stop collecting more than what is prescribed. Soldiers came and asked him, and, and what is it that we should do? And he told them, do not practice extortion. Do not falsely accuse anyone. Be satisfied with your wages. Now, okay, but that is a background. Now the people were filled with expectation. Come back to that line. Now the people were filled with expectation. All were asking in their hearts whether John might be the Christ. And John answered them saying, I am baptizing you with water, but one mightier than I is coming. I am not worthy to loosen the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Ex exhorting them in many other ways, he preached the good news to the people. 
So Father, again, we want to get them, you've given us a lot of the context, um, but uh, in particular, um, when we read this text, um, you mentioned Malachi. Uh, you mentioned, you began to mention Malachi, which I'm so glad you did because now you, met, you were talking at the first part of Malachi. I'm going to tell you guys, you got to go back and listen to this, this whole thing we're doing here and pick up every Old Testament text my brothers mentioned uh, and go back and do this Bible study because it will tremendously open your, your mind to understand all, not only what we're doing in these, in these gospel reflections, but all the biblical texts you're going to hear in the coming weeks in preparation for the nativity of the Lord. So now, now Malachi picks up, or I should say John the Baptist and Luke kind of picks up the second half of Malachi, doesn't he, Father? And, and begins to talk in those terms. So if you could kind of give us an insight into that. Yes, the, uh, the end of the prophet Malachi says, this is in chapter 3, uh, he starts to talk about how they're going to prepare themselves. He says, behold, the, the Lord is coming. The one you're expecting to come to the temple, the Lord is coming. But who will be ready when he comes? Because he will be like a refiner's fire. A refiner's fire is obviously a very, very hot furnace in which you can take gold or silver and then the impurities are burned off. And so he's, he's describing God's coming like a refiner's fire that will be so hot that all impurities will be burned up. He then says, as you come to the end of that uh, chapter three or chapter four, depending on if you have an RSV or a New American Bible, the last six, seven verses of uh, the prophet Malachi at the end of the book there talks about God coming again, like a, a massive forest fire. And that again, all the wicked will be burned up. Only the righteous will remain. And then, it, and after this very scary uh, description of God's coming to his people, that they've got to be ready. He says, but don't worry, I'm going to send Elijah the prophet who's going to prepare you so that when I come, you will be ready. When I come, you will be ready, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. So God has warned them about his coming and what it's going to be like. But then he also tells them that he's going to send someone before him to prepare the way so that the people will be prepared. So he's taking care of them on both ends here. And, and that's John the Baptist for that, Elijah. And, and that is, uh, um, I think, you know, where we can understand this, this kind of expectation. John the Baptist is, um, as you're saying, is fulfilling this prophecy uh, from, um, from, from Malachi. Um, and uh, the, the, there's this, this expectation that's building in the people that are standing there. So there's, there's kind of two groups here, isn't there? There's the guys who are standing on the edge, we could say, I was looking over at Luke chapter 7, verse 30, where it says that the Pharisees refused the baptism of John. So there's guys that are standing there, and they're, they're watching, they're listening to what John is doing, very similar to the guys walking around in Galilee, watching what Jesus is doing, but they never graduate to any faith. So they're standing there watching, they're testing John, but they're not willing to be baptized. And I think that he turns, there's two people here. He turns and says, you brood of vipers. And then among those people, there's a, there's a faithful remnant in a sense, they're standing there. They truly are preparing themselves. They truly have an expectation that's building. They're hearing John, what John's saying, and they're, they're, they're signing on. They're saying yes. And this is really a test for us today on Gaudete Sunday. Are we willing to sign on? You know, are we going to stay on the side and listen? And that's, you know, I wave the Jesus flag and be, you know, as it must have looked, you walk down the Jordan River and you've got crowds of people standing there. If you're coming over the crest of the hill, if you will, or you're, you're looking down at the valley and it's all filled with people, you just say, wow, look at all these people that are going to John. But in fact, there are two types of people standing there. There are people standing there that are waving the flag that look like they're going down to John. But at the same time, there's, there's, there's a, a core group that's really truly listening to what he's saying. And they're willing to do what Malachi is calling for. And that is restore in their heart a, a, a trust in the Lord. Uh, in a very tangible way, and that is to stop being so selfish in their life. You know, and just a little catechetical moment, maybe. Is sin is selfishness. Selfishness is sin. It's, 
All sin is a movement inward about me, about my life. How am I going to be satisfied? When is my vacation coming? What is this going to happen? You know, uh, uh, whereas, whereas the life of holiness is always a movement outward. It's always a, a movement of love. Love is the light, the giving of our life. So because, because that's God's life and God is love. So always this restoration. This is why the church is always taught. I'm going to test our listeners. I know there's a lot of non-Catholics that, that, that participate in our God, in our reflections each week. Um, this is why the church has always said you can pay, up, pay for your sins and pay them off, okay? And I wholeheartedly sign on to that. You can pay off your sins. Why? Uh, <laughs> no, don't get me wrong. Okay? Uh, you can't because when I begin to give of what I have, and a lot of times what I have is the money nowadays, right? We don't have a lot of sheep and goats in around my you know, field. I have money that represents my work. When I give that away, it is a, rest a restoration of the image and likeness of God within me. And so it, it begins to heal the, in the, the selfishness of sin through the generosity of what I have. This is why Malachi in, 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 uh, in, the, in the final, uh, well, it's not the final chapter, but it's, um, I don't think it's, yeah, it is. It's, well, it depends on your Bible because the, the chapter and verse markings are different. But he talks about tithing here. I love this passage on tithing. I know we're getting a little off a little tangent here, but just bear with me. This little thing on tithing is exactly what John's talking about, about you got two cloaks, give one away. Look, listen to what he says. Put me to the test. Okay, in my Bible, it's chapter 3, verse 10. Is that what it's, I know that someone like in the New American will be a different uh, verse there, Father. Is that? Uh, chapter you, 3, verse 10? Yeah. Is that true for everybody that has their Bible? I, uh, yeah, um, the, what happens is that in the New American Bible, there's only three chapters. So, yeah, base, yeah. so you just go with what you got there. So, okay, what, so, so listen, he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that, the Lord, that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down every overflowing, overflowing blessing, and the Lord is saying, you put me, you want it? You, you're, are you scared of, of living this life of self-giving love? Are you scared of giving that cloak away? Are you scared of, of giving a 10% a, a of what you have? Test me. He just says, you, you people, just test me in this. And just and see if every blessing doesn't open to you. And I know, you know, our father, uh, not our father, our father, our father, our dad, you know, was so, it, uh, this was such an important part of, of his life and it, for, for us, for Father Sebastian and I, he would have us sit down when he, his paycheck came in the mail and write those tithe checks, 10%. But we didn't always have a lot, but 10% right off the top. It, and, because, and he read this passage to us, put me to the test, says the Lord. And of course, in our life, I know I can speak for myself, Father Sebastian, I'm sure you agree. Look at the blessings. Look at the blessings. I mean, by the world standards, they say, no way. No way that you're going to be able to support your families and, and live a good life. And, and so, but look, every time there's a need, someone's standing at the door with free food or the extra cloak. Or The Lord has, has, has showered more blessings upon us than we could ever have imagined. Uh, but that is so important that we trust in the Lord and we begin to live that life of self-giving love. Let's jump right in here to the, to the epistle and listen to what St. Paul says. In letter to the Philippians, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Your kindness shall be known to all. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety at all, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make a request known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. All right, I just had to jump in here. This, that is so rich. This is the obviously Gaudete Sunday, as you've mentioned, this is why we call it this, right? It's rejoice, rejoice through all these readings. But this is just catechetically, this is so rich. It'd be great if you could wrap this up for everyone, I think, to connect this because now, back then, it was rejoice, rejoice, O remnant, faithful remnant, who will see the restoration, which of course is fulfilled in the first stage in the angel saying to Mary, Rejoice, O daughter Zion. Now the Messiah is coming, right? 
And now here is St. Paul 2,000 years ago saying to the newly formed church, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. I think that might have something to say for all of us, huh? You know, not only 2,000 years ago, Father, but today the church continues to say those same words for the faithful remnant, for the same faithful remnant today um, who is, has a reason to rejoice. Those who have a reason to have expectation. Those who have a reason. Why? Because as St. Paul says right here, the Lord is near. And we're not talking about near like Christmas is coming or the Lord is near because, you know, uh, he's, 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 uh, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be coming or he did come or, you know, whatever. No, he's near because he's here. He's, he's near. This is what the church is saying. This is what St. Paul is saying. They rejoice because your heart has been restored. You now are the one who can have an expectation because you heard the words of John the Baptist and you did something about it. You heard the words of Malachi and you did something about it. Rejoice because now your heart has begun to be restored. And then, then, because the restoration has taken place here, we can have an expectation that the fullness of that restoration is going to take place around us. We who are preparing ourselves for the coming of Christ. And, you know, there's a further, maybe final application that we can make as a way of invitation. Um, and to, to uh, we are working together here at the Institute uh, for, for a, so we can say, a restoration of this life of self-giving love, of learning the ways of the Lord again in our lives and being able to live that out and just share a little story of something that came across this morning, an email I received. I'll leave the names of the participants out, but someone just found out um, that their, their son had given um, a donation to the insti Institute during our, our Christmas drive. And he said, the parents say, oh, we've been praying for our kids all these years that they keep the faith. We've been praying for our kids that they, they, they learn what it means to be follower of the Lord. And here they realize that they're, what, the, what they're praying for has been fulfilled. Not because of, uh, well, I say this, why? How can they, they know that that's happening in the child's life? Because the person has learned a life of self-giving love. So during this, our Christmas drive, I ask you to, to consider, prayerfully consider, um, this is an invitation and opportunity to help us continue a mission uh, that John the Baptist was participating in, that the prophet Malachi was participating in, that prophet Zephaniah was participating in, that we're participating in today. And through the generosity of your self-giving love, we are able to continue that, this mission at the Institute of Catholic Culture. It's one way, it's not the only way. Uh, it's one way in which we can take what we have and say, open our hands to the Lord, to give of what is ours, that he might place into our hands the blessing he has prepared for us. So I ask you for your generosity during this time of preparation, generosity to the Institute of Catholic Culture, to our mission, that we can proclaim the good news as John the Baptist did in that final, I'm just thinking, Father, in that final verse, he continued to exhort them and in many other ways, he preached the good news to the people. That's the mission of the Institute. And if you want to participate in that mission of preaching the good news, I ask you to, to respond to John the Baptist's call today. If you have one cloak give, or two cloaks, give one away. If you have something, give it generously so that we can proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ together. To Christ our God be glory both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. A blessed Gaudete Sunday to, to everyone. Amen. Jesu quae me latum non caspicio, oro fiat illud quotan sitsi.